Good morning, and welcome to worship with Christ Lutheran Church on this third Sunday of Advent. Rejoice Always begins today's epistle reading from 1 Thessalonians. Both St. Paul and Isaiah in our Old Testament reading for this morning make clear that God will turn our mourning into laughter and shouts of joy. In the midst of our weary world, we pray that our God of power and might will indeed shine his radiance and bless us with hope as we prepare once again for the coming of our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the words of your prophets, that anointed by your Spirit, we may testify always to your light. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. comes from the prophet Isaiah, reading from the 61st chapter. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, 
the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations, and their offspring among all the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Thus far, the first lesson. second reading for this third Sunday in Advent comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit, 
Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Now grace to you and peace from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Today is the third Sunday in Advent, and we're closing in on the celebration of Christmas, the incarnation of God in flesh and blood in Christ Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us, now and always. We are not only preparing, as we've been talking about for the last couple of weeks, we're not just preparing for the celebration of that blessed Christmas miracle, but we're also preparing for his coming again, not as an infant, but as the one who is victorious over sin and death. Praise God. Praise God. In other words, this morning we're going to do some multitasking. Now, some of us are better at multitasking than others, right? A few years back for Christmas, one of my folks here at Christ Lutheran Church uh, sent me or gave to me a refrigerator magnet. And on that refrigerator magnet, it said, multitasking the ability to mess up multiple projects all at the same time. And I got a chuckle out of that, and after I stopped chuckling, I thought, I wonder if they're trying to tell me something. But be that as it may, I've really never gotten to the bottom of it. But what I mean today about multitasking is simply this. Our texts, our texts for today focus on both Jesus' first coming, the incarnation, Christmas, and Jesus' second coming. So we begin with Isaiah chapter 61, and we look at just the first four verses that we read just a few moments ago. This passage from Isaiah's 61st, cha 61st chapter was and is a messianic text. In other words, this was the text for the Messiah to announce when he came. And remember, you don't remember, I don't remember either, but back in the old, old days when kings would send messengers before them, they would, they would give those messengers a letter of introduction. This is, this is Joe, and he is my right-hand man, and he does this, he does that, listen to what he says, and uh, a letter of introduction. That's what this Isaiah chapter 61 text really is a letter of introduction, a, a sort of to-do list for the Messiah, a mission statement even of sorts. Five primary tasks that God would accomplish through God's chosen one. So that's Isaiah, right? We flash forward 600 years or thereabouts. Jesus has been born. He's grown up. He's been baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. He has been tempted by Satan in the wilderness after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. And now he returns to his homeland, his, his, his hometown of Nazareth, and he goes to the congregation where he grew up, his home congregation. And he's asked to read the lesson for the day, and he's handed the book of Isaiah. And what does Jesus do? He turns, he turns to Isaiah chapter 61, and he says this. Again, Luke chapter, chapter 4. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, Jesus found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me. That word anoint also means chosen, so he has chosen me, Jesus is reading, to proclaim good news to the poor, and not just the literally the poor, 
that he would proclaim to, but also the poor, those who are poor in spirit, who don't know God, right? He has sent me, that is, God has sent me, Jesus says, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, those who are in bondage to sin and death, which would be all of us, and recovery of sight to the blind, both physically in his miracles and spiritually as well, so we would finally see God's working in and through him, to, the, to set the oppressed free, to set the oppressed free. Again, this is being oppressed by sin, to set us free from sin. By the way, you may have noticed that in our, uh, in our creed, we will say he descended into hell. And what that literally means is the early church proclaimed that Jesus, on Holy Saturday, that's between Good Friday and Easter morning, Jesus went literally to Sheol, to hell, if you will, to preach the good news to the folks who had lived and died before he came in flesh and blood. That's a pretty powerful thing. That's a pretty powerful thing. I don't know about you, but if I had been there locked up and oppressed, I would say, yeah, I'll go with you, Jesus. Set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This refers back to the year of Jubilee in the Old Testament, where God said, folks, every 50 years, all debts will be forgiven. If you own property, it will go back to the original owner of the property. And this was to ensure a couple things. First of all, that being poor wasn't a, an ongoing thing. In other words, it wasn't a generation to generation situation. That at some point you would come back into your inheritance, okay? The second piece which is really important is uh, it's talking about the fact that nobody owned anything. Our understanding of stewardship. God has the people in the promised land in the Old Testament, but the promised land doesn't belong to the people of Israel. It belongs to God. He's letting them live there. He's letting them live there. He's like the landlord. So nobody owns anything. If we buy property here in, in the United States, you know, I've got the family farm. It's been in, in, in my, in my uh, uh, family for generations. I don't have a family farm. I'm just using that as an example. You get what I mean. But that would not be the case. No, God owns the land, so every 50 years it's got to go back uh, to the previous person who who had purchased it originally. So when you bought something, it was never in, in perpetuity. It was never forever and ever and ever. Uh, never at all. Perpetuity. Excuse me. Then, verse 20. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. You could hear a pin drop. This is just really a dramatic moment. A pregnant pause, if you will. Everybody's looking at him. And then Jesus says this. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Merry Christmas. <laughs> wow. Merry Christmas. The Christmas gift, the incarnation, has grown up. And now we know the truth of God's grace and gift. This is what Jesus, the anointed one, the chosen one, has come to do for you and for me. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Now the question is, do we accept this precious gift? You know, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do we believe in God and Christ Jesus? Do we trust him? Do we accept him? Do we receive him? Do we incorporate him in our lives? Do we abide in this gift and the giver of gift of the gift, God in Christ Jesus? In a couple weeks, we're going to talk about, are we King Herod? Are we the wise men? Or are we somewhere in between on the fence? But we'll get to that in a couple weeks. So we prepare for the first coming of Jesus. And, and again, I don't mean shopping days. I don't mean shopping days. No, we prepare our hearts to receive him anew. We clean out the clutter in the rooms of our heart. And by clutter, I mean the sin, the distractions, 
you know, the backwards, upside down priorities that we get messed up, anything that blocks us from Jesus, that keeps him out of our heart, we clean out that clutter, that Jesus may dwell fully, abide completely in our heart, that he would have complete access to all of our thoughts, words, and deeds, to all the rooms in our hearts, in other words, that we would surrender ourselves in totality to him. That's Advent, preparing to relive that night in Bethlehem and letting that night and that baby into our hearts. Our second act of Advent preparation is, deal, is detailed for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, our second lesson for today. And just a quick word of background. Uh, the Thessalonians uh, were a young church. Uh, Paul had... Uh, uh, was writing to them because it was now 20 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. And, and the Thessalonians were saying, well, where's Jesus? He was coming back, right? We thought he'd be back in a few days, but here it is 20 years down the road, and mom and dad have passed away, and my aunt and uncle have passed away. Everybody close to me has passed away who were in the Lord. What, what about them? And so Paul wrote Thessalonians, to wrote to the Thessalonians to encourage them and ensure and, and, and ensure them ensure them that this is not this is not what's going to assure them that this is not what's going to happen that their that their loved ones are not lost but the people are worried so he writes things like for example in in First Thessalonians in chapter four he'll say this in verse thirteen. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. We don't grieve our loved ones because we have hope in Christ Jesus. In chapter 5, verse 10, he says, Christ died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, his word for death, we may live together with him. It doesn't matter whether we're alive or dead, right? Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. And then Paul gives his final instructions to the Thessalonians and to us about what a Christian life, a preparation for the second coming of Jesus, looks like. What that looks like. He's encouraging them. So he says this, and it's our second lesson, although he begin, I'm going to begin a couple verses before. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And then comes the part that we shared a few moments ago. Rejoice always, he says. Rejoice always. Circumstances and situations are irrelevant. Rejoice always. How can we rejoice always? Well, we have faith in God's faithfulness and loving kindness. We trust in Christ Jesus. We trust our Christmas gift, in other words. I think back often to John chapter 16, verse 33, where Jesus tells his disciples, I've told you all these things so that I, in me, in me, Jesus says, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You're going to have trouble. You can't get away from trouble. But take heart, be of good courage, for I have overcome the world. Overcome, past tense. We have trouble in the world. We're troubled by that. But have peace in Christ because he has overcome the world. So in that, we rejoice. We are able to rejoice always. Pray continually, he says. It's an ongoing attitude of prayer, of conversation with the Lord, so that we are, when we do that, we are affirming the Lord's presence in us and with us and through us. We are showing our and affirming our dependence on God. We need you, Lord, every minute, every second of the day. 
And thirdly, we walk in obedience to the Lord. When, when I'm in a prayerful mindset just during the day, I'm not talking about being on my knees praying, I'm just being prayerful mindset. When temptations come my way, I am better able to resist those temptations and walk in obedience because I'm in a prayerful attitude. Now, that doesn't mean I'm always successful. Sometimes I say, sorry, Lord, I got to do this anyway. And, you know, as I repent of that, uh, you know, uh, the Lord forgives me from that. So I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm just talking about an attitude of prayer and walking in God's presence. And then Paul says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will for you, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. That's, that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing. You know, people will often ask me, I'm trying to find out, Pastor Tim, what God's will is for me. Well, Paul kind of gives us the, the, he gives us the ingredients here, right? We rejoice always, we pray always, we give thanks always, and everything else falls into place in our life of faith. By the way, it's really tough to give thanks in all circumstances. I don't want to just glean over that. It's tough. I came across a list of, of things that we can be thankful for that are kind of the reverse of what we would normally think. For example, be thankful for the fact that only you and God know the real you. I'm thankful for that every day. Or how about this? Be thankful that if you think your government, you're getting too much government, be thankful you're not getting as much as you're paying for. I kind of like that. Kind of pointed, right? Or here's another one. Be thankful that our teenagers will grow up and have teenagers of their own. I really like that one. But it's difficult. It is difficult to give thanks in all circumstances, but we can do that because of what God has done for us in Christ Jesus. Because you see, with Jesus, the cup isn't half empty. With Jesus, the cup isn't even half full. With Jesus, the cup is overflowing. So as you can see, God does the heavy lifting, right? But God in Christ Jesus does ask something of us. He goes on to say, do not quench the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit's talking with you, don't ignore it. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Don't make fun of prophecies, but test them, because God might be trying to tell you something. Hold on to the good. Abstain from every kind of evil. And then may God himself, the God of peace, Paul writes, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and we and he will do it. God does the heavy lifting, but he asks something of us. He asks us to prepare, to get ready, to watch. And we do that by abiding in him, trusting in him, loving him, allowing ourselves to be loved by God in Christ Jesus. You see, brothers and sisters, we are preparing to receive the best gift of all time. And the beautiful thing about it is the Christmas gift is not just a one-time gift. It's the gift that keeps on giving always. Thanks be to God for that. Amen.
As we prepare for the great gift of Holy Communion, let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. We confess that we are held captive by sin. In spite of our best efforts, we have gone astray. We have not welcomed the stranger. We have not loved our neighbor. We have not been Christ to one another. Restore us, O God. Wake us up and turn us from our sin. Renew us each day in the light of Jesus Christ. Amen. People of God, hear this glad news. By God's endless grace, your sins are forgiven. And you are free, free from all that holds you back, and free to live in the peaceable realm of God. May you be strengthened in God's love, comforted by Christ's peace, and accompanied with the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same manner also he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And we pray together as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ, shed for you.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. so much for being with us for worship this morning. Just an announcement regarding uh, this upcoming Christmas season. As we all regret that we cannot be together for worship this Christmas Eve, we hope that you will join us online at 5 p.m. for a very special family worship event featuring many of our children and also including Holy Communion or at 7.30 p.m for the beautiful worship of lessons, carols, and Holy Communion. We wish all of you a most blessed Advent and Christmas season. And now, do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.